everybody, and welcome to another edition of Average Superstar TV. I'm your host, Lauren Leprey. Please give me that humble respect and hit subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And this week, we're back in studio and uh, have one of my acting friends here. Uh, he's this a guy that uh, is a close friend of mine. Uh, he is also in the infamous Dark Military movie directed by myself. But he also has an interesting life of what he did in the real, uh, with his real world job. And with everything going on today, where we're talking about saving the planet and fossil fuels, I recently had a conversation with this guy, and I thought it was so good, it was just unexpected, that I think it would make a great show. He is all, he's involved with nuclear power. This was his uh, daytime job, which we're going to break down. And I think this is something that we are all misunderstood with. So with that, I welcome to the show my good friend, Dave Schaefer. How you doing, Lauren? Doing great, my friend. So yeah, Dave. Um, you know, you and I, we mostly talk about film all the time, but uh, mm -hmm. recently at our uh, last gathering, we went into fossil fuels and nuclear versus nuclear power versus this versus that. And brother, that conversation stuck in my head for days. And I just thought, I might say about getting you on the show. Like I said, I always like try to be knowledgeable. And I think this is a great topic for my audience here. So could you just tell us a little bit about your background of how many years and what exactly you did? Sure. Um, I started off uh, six years in the Navy on submarines. I ran the nuclear reactors on the submarine. Then I got into the commercial uh, nuclear power world. And for 18 years, I was in operations, half that as a field operator. And the other half, I was a control room operator. I spent 18 years in operations uh, department and half of that as a non-licensed operator and the rest of it as a nuclear regulatory commissioned licensed operator. And then later on, I was a senior reactor operator certification. So I've spent about 35 years in the industry. That's amazing. So this is uh, strictly the, the scary nuclear power plants that everyone's always scared of, right? Is yeah. Exactly where you worked. So yeah, the, uh, you can always spot them. They always have the big, you know, cooling tower and, uh, and also the, the steam coming out of those, it's just the river, being boiled. That's all it is. It's just steam. It's heat removal. There's nothing radioactive about it. We're not making bombs there. We're just making electricity. So anytime someone's driving around the highway and they see that, that is not pollution going in. That is steam towers. That's that exactly is water it. vapor. That's all it is. And you know what? I have to say, I was one of those people up until that conversation. I was like, look what is happening to our environment because of those things. And <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's amazing how you, when you just start asking some questions, how quickly you're like, oh, God, you know, like you don't know anything, but could you tell us exactly how nuclear power works? Well, what's special about nuclear power is how we make the heat and boil the water. And when you split a uranium atom, uh, they rub together, they uh, uh, release some energy, and that's where the heat comes from. Once we heat the water and it turns to steam, it's just like any other electrical generating plant. Uh, the steam turns to turbine, turbine turns electrical generator. That steam is condensed back into water and it's sent back into the reactor. And that's the simple cycle of it. Gotcha, gotcha. And how long were they around before the whole Three Mile? How, like, how long has nuclear power been around before the Three Mile Island incident? Well, they first started uh, on submarines, the USS Nautilus. I think that was in the mid 50s. And then um, a lot of the utilities saw where it was a very uh, robust way to make power. And it started probably in the late 50s, early 60s. And um, after Three Mile Island, we stopped building the plant, but we actually about probably 10 or 12 years ago, we just started building them again. Got you. And do you think the biggest, you know, problem that people just immediately like get scared of is the word nuclear? People always still have that stigma of like, do you oh, yeah. in Russia or you're going to nuke and that's going to be the end of the world? Because... Hey, hey. 100%. And that a lot of that has to do with the utilities not being more proactive in public relations. One of the big things is uh, a lot of people think these nuclear power plants are going to explode like a nuclear bomb, and it's physically impossible. There's just not enough uranium there. It's only like 5% uranium. That's it, where the bomb is like 100%, and we don't even make the fuel to make a bomb. So them physically exploding 
It's never going to happen. So what I don't know all those measurements and all that. I'm not going to act like, but basically what you're saying is you're making enough to feed power to the cities and its surrounding areas where a nuclear bomb is like a specific, you need a lot, right? Like that's it is an instantaneous to... nuclear reaction is basically what it is. It's a, it's a term we call prompt critical and it's a huge amount of energy and um, they are just extremely, extremely dangerous. And it's just the opposite of what a nuclear power plant does. Gotcha. And so that something like that wouldn't even be made there, right? Would that be like considered like on military ground? No, there are certain places that make uh, uh, nuclear weapons grade uranium uh -huh. and nuclear power plants. We, we don't make fuel. We actually use the fuel to, to boil the water to make the steam. So we don't make bombs or anything like that. Got you. So you and I are based in New Jersey. And how, how, how much percentage wise would you say of the state runs on nuclear? Well, if you look at the carbon free generation, it's about 50 percent, maybe up to 60 percent. And that's based on the uh, the Salem and Hope Creek nuclear power plants, which happen to be the second largest nuclear complexes in North America. Got you. And so when Three Mile Island happened, that mm -hmm. basically scared the crap out of everybody. And so that when we kind of started going backwards more towards coal, because even though they're hurting the environment themselves, it was just they felt safer, like coal's not going to blow the world up. Well, people were scared and they had a right to be really. I mean, the yeah. utility... The amount of misinformation that came from uh, Metropolitan Edison was just unbelievable. I mean, it, literally, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing or saying. I mean, there were a lot of mistakes done uh, made at Three Mile Island, um, and a lot of that changed the industry as we know it. Uh, there were plant designs that were poor. There were procedures that were poor. That were training that were uh, that was very very poor. But the biggest thing we learned was emergency preparedness and having somebody that knows what they're doing giving people the right answer and another thing that came from that is this group called the institute of nuclear power operations based in atlanta that gave the industry a single platform to share all their operating experiences because the the problem that happened at three mile island happened about a year prior to that at a plant in ohio but they happened to have the right people in the control room to catch it and if we'd have had info at that time and that information could have gotten at info Three Mile Island might have never happened. Yeah, wow. So in a small way, you say it was, it was management was the biggest problem between Ohio versus Three Mile Island? The people in the control room. I mean, they're, they're just, uh, they just made the right decision at the right time, and the guys in Harrisburg uh, didn't. Got you. So what's your, would you be able to explain what happened at Three Mile Island that would kind of make sense to the audience that, that what, compared to what they should have done? Sure. Um, what happened, they, they, they had a problem with one of their feed pumps and the feed pump tripped, means it, meaning it, it uh, stopped working. And then the backup feed pump started, but uh, maintenance had done some work on that pump earlier in the day and they forgot to open the isolation valves. So there was no water going to the steam generator. The steam generator uh, boiled down and then the reactor trip, because the water in the steam generator went down, reactor trip, meaning that all the control rods went in to shut the reaction down and all that kind of stuff. And when that happened, there was a pressure surge that opened up a relief valve. And that relief valve, the operators thought had closed and it didn't. And it was open for hours. And that's what caused the accident at Three Mile Island. Would you say, though, from what they did, is there like... I guess, like, if I just to say I was working there and I checked on something, is there someone that would check my work, like that that should have maybe avoided all this? I got in those days, probably not. In yeah. today's world, absolutely. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> and, and there's something else that this is one of the design changes that uh, every nuclear power plant had to make. Back in those days, when a valve opened or closed, it, what the the limit switches that would you would see if the valve was open or valve was closed didn't exist. It was just a just a, a, a demand. So when you look at, looked at your panel and the valve demand was closed, that's all you had. So they looked at it. The demand was closed, but the valve was was wide open. Nowadays, we literally have a switch that the valve will touch when it's closed, and then another one. Uh, it'll touch when it's open, and that's indicated on, on the control panel. 
So for people that were are scared that the whole thing was going to blow up and that would have been the end of everything, would would you say the the situation that happened at Three Mile Island was obviously it was a problem, but was it way more exaggerated than it really was? Were, were, were there a bit, you know what I mean? Could ra- radiation leaked everywhere? Could there, could there have been an explosion or was it something like, yeah, we got to take care of this, but it's not going to be as bad as, as it's Well, there were a lot of things that went wrong, but as far as a uh, catastrophic explosion that was going to take out the East coast and all that other kind of stuff, that, that just wasn't going to happen. Okay. And, um, and since that time, we put a lot of a lot of uh, equipment in place to make sure that uh, we can monitor the containment building better, because the, back in those days they just didn't have the monitoring capability that we have nowadays. Gotcha. And did, right around that time, didn't some movie come out in China or Japan that scared the crap out of everybody about about nuclear? Oh yeah, called, oh yeah, it was called the China Syndrome. It came out a week before the Three Mile Island accident. Uh. And it was kind of funny talking to the people because I actually met some of the people that were in the control room and they said that the, uh, the local newspaper had taken out an ad or act the, the utility had taken out an ad in the newspaper saying, don't believe about all the hype about this movie. Cause it would just never happened. And sure enough, it did. Man. So once that ended, uh, I, I, I know one of the things I brought up was that three mile Island documentary on, on Netflix would do you say you were saying you think that was just more for show? That's not yeah, like that you know. was not a documentary. That was more of a mockumentary. I had uh, talked with some of the people online and stuff like that about the show. And it was really, really done in poor taste. Uh, it was a little bit of fact and a whole lot of fiction. Uh, one of the guys they centered, uh, they centered around this guy uh, had no commercial operating experience whatsoever. Uh, he, I think he had some Navy experience, but the difference between the Navy plants and these big commercial plants are night and day. And, uh, he didn't even work at the plant when, when the accident happened, he was hired three or four years later as a quality insurance inspector. So he really, and I could tell by the terms he was, he was using, he really, really didn't know what he was talking about. I just find that so fascinating. So he wasn't there for that. So he couldn't have been the whistleblower either. No, no, that was all a bunch of BS. And, you know, as as good as the HBO show on Chernobyl, Chernobyl was, this Netflix mockumentary was 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 not good at all. Gotcha. So, well, you already opened up the biggest can of worms of, of it all. So as far as uh, Chernobyl goes, uh, I believe you told me, number one, that place was built wrong. Well, it wasn't built up to the international standards. Uh, those RBMK reactors, that's, that's the side. Um, they're designed differently. They use a lot of the graphite blocks that you saw in the HBO special. But one of the biggest differences between the Soviet Union's plants at, in those days and the international plants is the international plants have these huge containment buildings that hold uh, all of the uh, energy sources like the reactor, the steam generators, things like that. And these concrete buildings are five and six feet thick of concrete and uh, one inch plate steel, all this kind of stuff. So if you do have any kind of an explosion or anything like that, steam explosion, anything like that, it's all contained within the building. The Soviet Union didn't have anything like that. They basically had an aluminum building. That was it. So that when they built these, this thing, do you think they were kind of just basically cutting corners, like like doing bad building codes basically uh, we would with houses like you, you kind of bypassed all that to save money. Is that all you think that happened there? I think it might've been, I think it might've been a little ego in there. You know, we know what we're doing. We don't need those things because it's never going to happen here. Yeah. And, uh, I read the, the control room notes at, on uh, Chernobyl and the senior supervisors were very arrogant about that. When the operators brought up uh, operation uh, issues, they just shut them down. They said, you know, if you don't want it, get yourself relieved and get somebody else in here that they would not hear of it. Gotcha. And this was about what, 1985 ish. Um, I think it was 85 or 86. I okay. can't quite remember, but the, uh, so the Soviet union still together. So yeah, I, I know they were always trying to, you know, be the best of the best. So I just wondered right. if they, you, you think it might've been a little pizzazz, a flare of like you guys did what over there and spent how much watch us. We're going to spend only this much and run just as well. You think that's what they kind of did? 
Well, you know what, Lauren? I'm not sure because in those days, the Soviet Union was so secretive about everything. Yeah. When this happened, they didn't tell anybody anything about it. And the only reason the world knew about it was a nuclear power plant in Sweden. Uh, the workers were leaving uh, uh, the nuclear power plant to go home. And every time you leave a nuclear power plant, you go through the last monitor, a radiation monitor, make sure you don't have any kind of contamination or anything. And the monitors were alarming. And they started and they did uh, uh, some analysis and they found out it wasn't even the fuel that they had. So they thought that the new that the Soviets had tested a nuclear weapon or something. And then uh, they got everybody else involved. And finally, the Soviet Union said that we had had a, a, a nuclear uh, accident at uh, Chernobyl. Wow. Yeah, that was pretty sad. I, I was actually on the submarine in Seattle and we picked up alpha contamination from uh, the Soviet Union. That it just circled the earth. That that's how it got in the, the jet stream and that's all it is all it took. So what when you that happens to you, what what do you do? Is there, is there like like how does it get out of your system? Well, the biggest thing is um you don't want it to get in your system. That's uh, in into you. I mean, into. alpha and beta can barely go through your skin where gamma radiation is what they use x-rays for. I mean, it just goes through your in through the but it has to be very energetic to do that. Gotcha. But a lot of this stuff is really, really not going to do that much harm to you at all, really. I mean, the people that sadly passed away at uh, Chernobyl, I know the news people say there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people. There were 31 people that died directly from a, a radiation exposure at the, uh, Chernobyl. That's definitely still too many, but that's a oh, giant sure. number difference of exaggeration. Right. And also, you have to remember in those days, it was very hard to get information out of the Soviet Union. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and reading a lot of the uh, political opinions about when that happened, a lot of people say that was the initial step that caused the breakup of the Soviet Union, that they just mishandled that so poorly. And they literally had to call in help from the international people to uh, to get a hold of this reactor. Yeah. yeah. And and what, what set that off? Was, was 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 that was that uh, I guess everything should always be avoided. But was this this something that they overlooked, or is this something that just happened? No, th this was a planned test. And oh, okay. what happened is, uh, I'm not going to get into details because it gets really really complicated. Okay, yeah. But they were supposed to be at a low power, and because of the grid demand, they were at a, a, a much higher power most of the day. So when it uh, so when they uh, when it was time to do the test, the power had coasted down through reactor dynamics and things like that. So they pulled the control rods up to increase power. And they had already shut off a lot of their safety interlocks and safety systems that would prevent this from happening. And then power got lower and lower and they and they started to uh, pull the control rods out even more. And they found out that they really weren't going to be able to do the test. So they started to insert the control rods. And at those low powers, uh, those RBMK reactors are unstable. And what happened is the power peaked, I think, at 100 times of the design of the reactor. And all of the water turned into steam. And when you take a pound mass of water and put enough energy in it to make it steam, it takes up seven times as much area. So all that water, 100 and something thousand gallons of water in that reactor, flashed the steam and the pressure relief valves weren't big enough to relieve that much pressure. So the lid on this thing, which is anchored with bolts, it's a 150 ton lid, it blew off the top of the reactor and came down at an angle and hit the top of the fuel and knocked the bottom of the vessel out. Because the vessel is just a big steel bowl and it knocked the bottom of that out. And that's where the, the fuel uh, started to melt and it went through the building. And I know you've seen pictures of the elephant foot, uh, of the elephant's foot at the bottom of the building and that's the fuel that was supposed to be in the uh, in the core and that steam explosion is what blew the roof off of the building of the of their so-called containment building and that purple fire that you saw was just the graphite and the uranium literally on fire it was pretty crazy great so was that at i guess what you're saying th th it's not made for to be a nuclear bomb but could that if that got worse, could could that have just would, would it have been more of an explosion or would it have been more of radiation that shot and, and, and hurt more people? 
Well, what happened was the radiation was totally exposed. The, uh, the, the uranium fuel that was supposed that that was in the fuel rods, these long tubes that got exposed. And then that's all in the atmosphere. And that's where the fire and that's where you see the fire, the smoke going up in the atmosphere. That is just highly contaminated uh, fuel particles that are uh, just give off huge amounts of uh, radiation. And the only way to shut that down is you saw the helicopters dumping by ba uh, bags of reactor poison, which could be boron or something like that to shut the reaction down. So basically you had a nuclear reaction just out in the open, but the fuel for an uh, atomic bomb to work, the fuel is very, very compressed. It's like the size of a basketball. And this uh -huh. fuel that they had, it just spread out all, all over the building. So it's not in what they call a critical mass to, to do anything, but just, generate a lot of radiation between i i, I realize they're two we're talking about two different situations but between what happened at three mile island and what happened in russia what do you do for the area to kind of get it back like more safe i guess more chernobyl is obviously the, the worst problem but once that stuff gets in the air what what is it is it the time could you do something to it physically yeah, the uh the radioactive strength of these uh atoms is based on their half-life so you have to look where uh like if it's it has a radiation uh uh level of a year and uh in one year it'll be half of the original strength that it was that it started at if, if, if that makes sense and over a couple of years that radiation level just slowly slowly dies down i mean and they put a huge uh containment structure over chernobyl now and then it, basically everything is pretty much locked up but uh, but around the area, you know, it's like nature. Nature nature's going to rebound. And they yeah, do. so is this area? Could you go even go near Chernobyl now? Oh, absolutely. Matter of fact, it's a it's a tourist destination. And even after the evacuation of uh, Pripyat, which is the town that was outside of Chernobyl, there were six or seven hundred people that never left, and they're totally fine. You so know, there's no, there's the, no the way, yeah. fish, there's nothing like that. So it's not like a, like the Badlands where it's just like yeah, because the way that even the documentary made it sound was just kind of like you can't go near Chernobyl at all. Like it's like you know. <laughs> well, initially, before they got everything under control, sure, I I, I wouldn't want to go there, but I mean, it's uh, na nature's going to take care of that. Like all the all the. Um, the, the wildlife is back, all the all the, the natural scenery around there. The If you look at the town, it's all overgrown with uh, shrubs and trees and grass and everything. So it's, um, you know, the further away from the plant, the radiation gets less and less. And it gets to a point where it's really not going to do you a lot of harm. I mean, if you think about it, if you get really, really sick, what's the first thing they do is they, they irradiate you, you know, to, to, to try to heal you. Yeah. But, uh, but then on the other hand, at... Uh, Three Mile Island, there was so little radiation released that, uh, I mean, you could build a house right next to the plant and you're not going to have any problems. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess for uh, dramatic purposes, they really tried to slam the, you know, <laughs> Three Mile Island and Chernobyl of like, don't go ever near it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, and, and that's a, um, and that's one of the problems with nuclear power. We need to tell people that it's, 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 it's safe. These plants are built incredibly well. And as far as, you know, looking in the future with the, with the greenhouse gases and all that other kind of stuff, if you're going to try to meet your demand, you're going to have to have nuclear power because coal plants aren't going to do it. Natural gas aren't going to do it. Wind and solar, their efficiencies are so low and they're, uh, you really can't count on them all the time. So it's got to be a mix of all that. But nuclear power definitely has got to be a part of that. Yeah, yeah well, that's a good area to stay in. So how come... I guess it's because of those two incidences, but the reputation, like how do you even market that? Why is there is why is there not marketing for nuclear power? <laughs> you, you hear we always hear on the news like go solar, go this, use this, use that, you know, use Tesla, you know, but you don't ever hear anything about nuclear power outside of the Simpsons. <laughs> true, true. And uh because everybody thinks that, you know, electric cars and uh, wind power and all that other kind of stuff are going to be able to shut all the nukes down and all that other kind of stuff because it's easy to understand. That's a big thing. And uh, I know when I was in charge of our control room simulator, I gave a lot of tours to a lot of different groups, explaining them the safety 
and how the plant works. And I've had uh, U.S. senators in there. I've had uh, state senators, all kind of business group, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you name it, anything to show the people that this is a safe way to make electricity. Yeah. And obviously, without saying, there's probably a lot of protocols of inspectors that come in and check those places on a regular basis. And I'm sure they're not light about it, right? Oh, good. We have two <laughs> nuclear regulatory commission inspectors that are permanently assigned to each nuclear power station in the country. Mm -hmm. So we're always under observation. We're always being inspected. We have QA departments that are always watching the work, making sure that we follow the procedures. And even when we get parts in to replace parts, there's a huge protocol that those parts have to go through. And it's all about the paperwork, the pedigree, all this other kind of stuff. Is this equipment designed to do what it has to do? And I'll give you an example. If you have a seal on a pump, let's say it's a 12 inch mechanical seal. If it's a non-nuclear seal, it's probably 15 or $20,000. If it's nuclear, it's over a million. That's how much money is spent on research and making sure this seal will not fail when we need it. Got you. And like you said, you, there's people watching you, I guess, through the cameras, like a team. So it's almost like that scene in the casino where the eye in the sky is watching us all. There's this, there's this teams watching what everybody's doing, right? Well, not necessarily cameras, but there's always somebody watching what you're doing. Even in the control room, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to have my uh, shift partner in there. I'm going to show him this is what I'm going to do, and this is why I'm going to do it, and this is the procedure that I'm using, and he will okay that. Uh, we call it peer checks. Gotcha. And, uh, just to back each other up, and, and he'll do the same when he's ready to do something, and that's just the nature of the business. Gotcha. Nah, that, 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 that's great. So, I mean, when you're going forward in the future and all that, you're saying – is nuke actually have any real drawback the, the, like this, this straight shooting or is it just that the reputation is well it's the reputation uh, but that's slowly being repaired but a lot of it has to do with the expense of these nuclear power plants they are very expensive to build because a third of their budget is nothing but research, uh, research and analysis uh, we're building a new plant in georgia is a dual plant uh their westinghouse plants they are 10 years behind schedule and I think about $15 billion over budget. So, so you just said, you just said 15 billion, which is a ridiculous amount of money. So on mm -hmm. average, what is a, what is a cost to build one of these things? I would say for a single unit, maybe eight to $12 billion in between eight to 10 years to build them. And I, I mean, they're being built all over the world. China's building 30 or 40 of them. Uh, France, they're, they're France, their electricity base is is a uh, nuclear 70 percent of their electricity you know so so they they uh embraced nuclear power years ago so and they lead the world uh as far as uh percentage of electricity from nuclear power wow so it's just so you'd probably almost say the biggest drawback is the time and the money that it takes to build one of these things because mm -hmm. they're not going up in six months <laughs> No, 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 uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're not. And also it takes a lot of people uh, to run these plants. And I've had discussions with other people that they can say, well, what about nuclear waste? Uh -huh. And I said, nuclear waste is not really a problem. If you look at all of the high level radiation of nuclear waste that has been generated since the 50s, it can be put on a football field about 10 feet deep. That's it. That's all of it is. Where like coal it's generating all this ash. I think it's a hundred million tons a year or something like that. It's massive amounts of, uh, of discharges going straight up in the air. And you look at some of the uh, videos from the towns in China, you know, it, it looks like a, a, a windstorm and that's a normal day because they are uh, because of all the coal plants there. Yeah. Yeah. So we're also, so like, hey, solar and happy and, uh, you know, the electric cars and all that. But And people are getting so excited when they buy the electric car, but mm -hmm. they're charging their car with electricity. Coming from by, a or, or raised by fossil yeah. fuel. So it's yeah. like a double yeah. standard. Well, that's what they have to realize. The electric car is not a power source, <laughs> right? It, it, it is just a, uh, uh, it's a storage device. That's all it is. So mm -hmm. something has got to charge that. And most of the most of the United States, when you plug your car into the wall, it's going to come from either a coal plant, a natural gas plant, uh, a hydro plant. And a little bit of that is 
it's going to be nuclear. <laughs> and then, besides that, you, I've talked to people who have them, like the Teslas and the other type, and they're always they have range anxiety. They always concerned about the range, you know, because they don't want to get stuck somewhere and they're done. You know, you can't carry five gallons of electricity to your car. Wow. Yeah. I get what they're trying to do. I can't like regard you on that. But when it's like, <laughs> that's like saying, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go vegetarian and stop eating meat and chicken. But I eat those turkeys over there every day. <laughs> well, like, you know, uh, electric cars ha have their place. Absolutely. You know, but if, but the majority of the world's CO2 gases and stuff like that are coming from industry. I think I think cars, I think I read it, they're less than 10%. I'm not even sure. But I mean, there's a lot of people being very aggressive out there. If you look at Paris, I think it was last year, they've just about outlawed gasoline cars in Paris. I mean, they've taken away 70% of the parking spaces and made them bike lanes. Uh, they've slowed, the, they put the speed limit, I think it's 18 miles an hour just to get people uh, frustrated to go that slow. And they're almost forcing them to take mass, mass transit, you know, just to get these cars out of, out of, uh, Paris. But there, there's a place for electric cars. Just realize that you're, you're not being all green, have an electric car. Just remember <laughs> that. And then also you have to, you, you, I don't know if those batteries are recyclable. I don't know. I don't know what you're going to do with the old ones. Something to think about. Yeah, without a doubt. And when, but while we're at it, let's talk about, uh, or big wind towers that are going on. So, what are oh, your yeah. what are you, what are your thoughts on those? Because they're well, um, actually there's a big wind farm that's going to be out off the coast of Atlantic City. Uh, the New Jersey uh, elect uh, the New Jersey uh, utility that I uh, uh, worked for uh, teamed up with a Danish. Uh, yes, I think it's a Danish company, and they're going to build these huge off a uh, huge offshore generators. I think it is 1100 megawatts. I mean, there's a lot of wind generators. These things are 400 feet tall. I mean, they're huge. And there's no, and the thing about these, these wind generators, the amount of energy it took to make these wind generators, they will never generate that much electric, if that makes sense. And they're building them um, actually near the Salem and Hope Creek power plants, because these blades, some of these blades are 150, 200 feet long. The the uh, the segment structures, once they're uh, bolted together and everything, is about 400 feet, and they anchor them to the bottom of the ocean. And then those electrical cables come to an underwater substation, and that cable is run to an above-ground substation. And uh, I think one electric or uh, one wind generator, I think, is good for like 1.2 million watts, and that can generate about 40,000 uh, homes uh, uh, worth of electricity. Gotcha. And, and do these things have an expiration date? Yes, they do. And they're finding out it's not near as long as they thought. These <laughs> blades are made of fiberglass. And uh, the wind damage on the leading edges, edges of these blades are really, really getting beat up by, by the ocean. And they're, uh, they're starting to fail. Uh, and also, these blades are not recyclable. And um, so I think they're... Heard, you just said they're 150 to 200 feet. So that's they're not recyclable. Correct. So you got to gotta replace them, and you put this where? Put it in the ground. I mean, where else are you gonna? What else are you gonna do with it? Wow. You know, and that's something else about nuclear power is these nuclear plants were initially designed for forty years worth of uh, operation, and they're and that was based on the reactor vessel where everything is happening, the the metallurgy inside the reactor vessel, and they're finding out that that was uh, they're extremely over engineered. And they're finding out that these plants can easily run an additional 20 years. And uh, and basically their operating licenses are all being extended for 20 years because that's about the only thing in a reactor plant you can't replace. But uh, you're telling really me that these plants could run up to 60 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in a small way, depending, you know, 60 would be a bad year to be to be dead these days, but it's almost a lifetime. In a, in a small way, like a three fourths of, of of someone's life, just about. And you look at the efficiencies, the uh, the capacity factors, and a nuclear power plant's capacity factor is ninety two percent. That means it makes ninety two percent of its power twenty four seven, three sixty five for a year and a half straight. Then they shut them down for a month, refuel them, and do it for another year and a half. Where like I think solar, or I think solar maybe thirty percent and 
uh, wind maybe 25%. And, uh, and this is, a good, and, and there's something else that you need to talk about when you're comparing the different uh, styles of power is you have to look at the KW uh, per square foot footprint. Like a nuclear power plant where I was from, the entire generating area you could probably put in a 50 acre field, the three reactors, three turbines and that kind of stuff. And there was a study uh, two or three years ago, if they wanted to replace the island, uh, the artificial island where those three plants were with solar panels in New Jersey, you need 177,000 acres of solar panels. So you'd have to find 177,000 acres in New Jersey and it all have to be flat. You'd have to level everything to put the solar panels up. Yeah. So solar panels are not cheap, not cheap one. Not cheap. Are you, are you basically saying the, the problem with solar is they're just their outputs just not strong enough? Is that what you're well, basically it's it's what they call a just in time uh, electrical source. When the sun goes down, they stop working. Yeah. You know, so it can never be what they call a base load. It can't be a relied upon to generate electricity 24 7, 365, because it's not going to generate when it's raining. It's not going to generate at night. You yeah. know, and then when, when it starts to snow, you have to have somebody to get the snow off the panels or they're not going to work, you know, and just like wind, if the wind stops blowing, the uh, the big windmill stops turning. So you think that's more of a, they have a place, maybe like more of like small towns where maybe they could, they could kind of line up in open areas, but like, as far as ever, you know, power source in a major city, no way. I don't think so. Not a major city. I mean, you have to have number one, you have to have a wind source like some of these places in Europe where it's windy all the time. Sure. Yeah. W wind generators are a great idea and they're using them. Yeah. But here in the States, I mean, the majority of the area is not going to be good for wind generators. But once again, I think it's I think wind generators are, ju are going to be part of the solution, along with solar, along with uh, nuclear and along with geothermal and any anything else like that but we got to get away from the coal and we got to get away from the natural gas got you so you basically say it's kind of it's kind of good to have a backup to a back there's plenty of room for everybody but coal and gas are yeah i think if we have a a, a, a good uh spread of different power sources i think that's the way to go you know you don't want to put everything on nuclear you don't want to put everything on solar well it's just it's not feasible and it, it's not going to make sense because it's, it's too unreliable and anymore, uh, electricity is not a luxury. It's a necessity. You got to have it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. We can't need to have a reliable source and a cheap source. You know, yeah. I mean, people, electricity bills, they're a whole lot cheaper than they could be, if if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And I mean, we're uh, we're constantly running. Like that's all we're talking about these days. Is you know inflation everything going up and right. how much gas do we have left i mean we you know, i don't know i don't know I, I don't even know how many years we have left of that but of natural gas yeah uh, it, it's 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 there's a lot left yeah a whole lot left and, but the problem is again it's a just in time fuel source so if the source stops the electrical generation stops cuz there's no way to store it you don't have a nitrogen tank that big to let it run for a month or anything like that. And that's another problem with solar panels. Okay. It's great when the sun's up, you know, and if you're making more than you're using, there's nowhere to store it. Yeah. You know, so you, you kind of use it as you get it where nuclear power is there all the time. So they base that, they get it up to a certain percentage and then they'll start adding in like hydro and up kind of stuff to take it up to uh, uh, the, the amount of electricity that's needed that day. Got you. And I mean, as far as the future is going, you, is, is that basically what you're saying is, is between the three of them, it's kind of keep a unit going here. And I mean, do you see, do you have a prediction of the future where we're going to end up landing with all with as far as power goes? Well, truthfully, I don't think the coal plants and nuclear and the, uh, the gas plants are going away anytime soon no. because it takes so long to build, build nuclear power plants and because they're so expensive. And you also need a political structure structure that will be positive for nuclear power and allow to learn. I mean, if you look at if you look at California, they shut all theirs down uh, because no one really likes nukes out there. And the last one they have uh, is scheduled, I think, to be shut down in six or seven months. And they're starting to realize maybe that's not the best thing. If we want to meet our CO2 uh, emission standards, 
uh, you're not going to do it without nuclear power. It's it's not going to happen. Gotcha. Okay. Well, um, that was freaking awesome. Is there anything you think we, we missed out on? Um, I don't think so. I think if you haven't seen the HBO uh, show Chernobyl, I think you really need. I think you really need need to give it a good shot. It's it's technically accurate, and they do a good explain a, a good explanation of what happened, and you can actually sense the political pressure of the operators that were in the control room, and uh, and it's very much how the Soviet Union was back in those days. It really is, and uh, and on the other hand, I wouldn't really waste that much time on uh, Netflix's uh, Three Mile Island. So thumbs up for Chernobyl and uh, the Netflix Three Mile Island. Thumbs down for your profession. Absolutely. Well, that's good. I think everybody watching this should definitely uh, check both of those out and uh, just remember this interview when you when when, when you're watching both of them. But uh, yeah, for yeah. sure. And uh, you have since retired from from that right now. With those. Yeah, I retired two or three years ago. Uh, spent probably thirty five years in the business and. Uh, uh, Love the job, love the people. You know, it was a great job. I really enjoyed being in the control room and uh, very, very satisfying career. Yeah, well, and now I know uh, how I originally knew you was uh, you're in acting. So uh, yes. is, there any, is there anything anyone could see you in right now? Or I'm, in a, uh, I'm in a sitcom on Apple TV called Metro Park, and uh, I'm the mayor of, uh, of the town. It's an Indian-American uh, sitcom. And uh, we just got the green light for season three, I believe. And uh, hopefully we'll be shooting that here soon. Sweet, sweet. All right, Dave. Well, Dave, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thanks for having me. And thanks. I thank this audience once again for tuning in. Uh, please give us that subscribe button on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And with that, I will say see you next week.